Time for another deep dive into an Obsidian plugin. This time we look at the Metadata Menu plugin. Let's go! The Metadata Menu plugin is quite powerful, so this video contains a lot of information. To make it easier for you, I added more chapters than usual. Depending on what you're interested in, you should be able to easily jump around between them. Having said that, if you don't know the plugin at all, I suggest watching the chapters in order. I structured them to cover five main parts. First, an overview. What does the plugin actually do? Second, the setup. This covers plugin installation and settings. Third, some basics. Here, we learn about the available field types and their settings. Fourth, the file classes. The plugin works with so-called file classes, and here we explore what they are and what they do. And fifth, practical demos. This is where we put all of the above together. I prepared a few showcases to illustrate the plugin's capabilities on its own and in combination with the Obsidian Canvas. As each of these parts has various chapters, you may want to grab a snack and a beverage. This is going to be a long ride. In the official documentation, the link to which I left in the description, it says that the plugin gives us context menu items for nodes to modify front meta and inline fields. It can define preset types and values, and we get auto completion for higher front meta consistency. Sounds great, but there are a few things we need to do before we can reap all these benefits. For this video, I will use a completely new vault, so you can see what you need exactly to make this work. After creating a new vault, we have to go to Settings, navigate to Community Plugins, and turn off the restricted mode. This allows us to install Community Plugins by clicking on Browse, searching for the Metadata Menu Plugin, and clicking Install and Enable. Right away, we get an information message that we also need to install the Data View Plugin. So we just repeat these steps, searching for it, installing and enabling it in the same way. Before we go to the Metadata Menu settings, we need to check those of the Data View Plugin. In order to work properly, we need to enable the second and third option to allow the execution of JavaScript and inline JavaScript queries. With that done, we can move on to the Metadata Menu settings. The first option is to define whether the plugin shall index only fields in the front meta or also inline fields anywhere in our nodes. By default, this is set to full node, but this could have a negative performance impact. So, if you experience those, you might want to change it to front meta only. Then, we can choose whether or not a node's context menu shall show all the available field options or, to keep the context menu shorter, to summarize them under a single menu item called Field Options. Let me quickly jump over to my main vault and show you the difference. I currently have this option turned off, so when I right-click on a node, the context menu will show me the Field Options entry and, after clicking it, I get a list of available options. If I turn the option on and right-click on the same node, the context menu will include all these options right away. This makes it longer, but also saves you one click. Personally, I prefer to have it turned off. The next four options let us define various exclusions. We can tell the plugin to ignore certain folders, extensions, file name patterns or fields across the vault. By default, nothing is excluded and you can adjust those as you see fit. The autocomplete option does exactly what it sounds like. If turned on, the plugin will suggest existing values for you to choose from when entering them into your front meta. If you turn it off, this will not happen, of course. If you want to keep an eye on the field indexing status, you can activate the display of a small icon in Obsidian's status toolbar. You can also choose how a set of multiple values for a property shall be displayed. The options are Array and Indented List. The last option under Global Settings is pretty straightforward and lets you define the first day of the week. By default, and for me, it is Monday, but you can change it to Sunday. In the next section, we can define global presets for certain fields. Let's add a field called Status. In the field settings, we allow only the selection of a single value from a list. The list itself we define right here. It contains only three options. To do, WIP for work in progress, and done. If I create a new node, right click on it and go to field options, we now have the option to add missing fields at section. 
I click on it and choose to add the missing fields to the end of the front matter. This adds the status field that we just defined and also lets us pick one of the defined values for this field. Under the file class settings, we prepare the ground for some of the metadata menu magic later on. First, we need to tell the plugin where to find our class files. This folder has to exist, so let's exit the settings for a moment and create it. As this is a new world, I do not have any folders yet. However, it is not my first world and I expect it to grow. So, I want to make sure that all the things I need to organize the world are separated from my actual nodes and content. This is why I usually create a folder called 90organize. In there, I add anything I need. In my main world, this includes classes, databases, lookups, templates, and canvases. For now, I only create a folder classes inside the organize folder. Back in the settings, I can now select this folder as the path to our class files. Next, we can define a name for the file class field. You can leave the default or change it. As this is how the field is shown in the front matter, I prefer to call it just class. The global file class setting lets us define one class that shall be applied to all nodes, even if no class is specifically defined in the node. You can use that to define some fields that you always want on your nodes and to add these fields to legacy nodes that were created before you started using file classes. As I don't have any file classes defined yet, I leave this empty for now. Next, we can limit the number of results, that means pages using a class, when viewing the class files settings. We will see this in a bit. And the last option here lets us decide whether the plugin's dialog window or modal shall include an option to select file class. In the metadata menu button section, we can define a default icon for the button. We will come to those a bit later and decide under which circumstances the icon shall be displayed. By default, these are all enabled. I recommend leaving them as they are in the beginning. And then disable those which you don't want to see after having used the plugin for a while. The last section here lets us add a query and a file class that will be applied to all files matching the query. When it comes to fields, we need to understand that each field is defined by three things. A name, a type, and type-specific options. Currently, the Metadata Menu plugin supports 18 different field types. Any field can be defined in the plugin settings, as shown earlier, or via a file class node. If you define the same field in both places, then the file class node will have priority over the plugin settings. I will quickly demo them all, and some of them we will see in action later on. All right, I will start by creating a new class called demo in my classes folder. And to this class, we're going to add all the different fields. So let's keep everything else for the time being and go directly to file class fields, hit the add field button, and start with the first type of field, which is an input field. For all these fields, you have additional options. You can set a command for the field. You can define how it should look like when it's used inline, meaning inside the node rather than in the front matter. And of course, you can define or select the field type. As you can see, we have the whole list of the 18 types available. And for an input field, I just stick with this one. Next up, we're going to add a field which lets us pick a single value from a list. So let's say this list single. Now, which values I can pick from is something I can define directly here in the field settings, or I can use alternative sources. They can come from a node, or they can come from a data view query. For now, we just stick to defining them in the settings. I will quickly add here the values 1, 2, and 3, respectively. Then we have the option to create a field that lets us pick multiple values from a list. Once again, I will define the, value, the values right here. The next field type, which is similar to a list, is a cycle value list. Once again, we select the type, we define the values. The difference here is that instead of picking one or multiple values from the list, you will have a button in the properties which lets you cycle through the values on, on the set list. Next field type is very common, and very useful as well. It's a simple checkbox field, which can hold three different types of values. It can accept true or false, but also a null value, which might be useful for running queries against it later on. Then we have the option to add normal number fields. These can hold numbers, as one would expect, and can be used for formulas and calculating things. Additional options for numbers field is you can have a step here, so say five, for example, 
This means that once you use it in your nodes, you will have buttons for increasing or decreasing the value in this field by this defined step. So plus or minus five in my case. If you want, you can define a minimum and a maximum value for the respective field, but this is of course optional. Obsidian is all about linking nodes. So it's not a big surprise that we can also have a link field in our class definitions. In fact, we can have two different ones. One is for single links, so link links to single documents only. And in here, we have additional options. We can use data view queries. We can also define aliases, how the link is supposed to look like when it's displayed. And we can define the sorting order. You have examples here how to use these things. So I will just leave everything as it is by default. And then we add another field for multiple links, which works basically the same way, but of course allows you to have more than one link as a value in the respective field. Another all-time favorite is a date field, which of course lets you store dates. Again, additional options here. You can format the date in the way you want. You can pick the option to insert a link by default. Link path can be defined, but is optional. You can define a shift interval, which once again, when you're in the properties in the dialog, you can use buttons to increase or decrease any given date by this specific interval. And you can also have a dynamic field containing these intervals. So in my case, it suggests a cycle field because it's the one with defined numbers already, but I will leave this set to none. The next one is a bit more than a simple field. It's one that can hold a lookup query. So if we go here to lookup query, then we have first the option to see we want this field to be updated automatically, which I usually turn on. I have not yet had problems with queries or performance issues here. And then we can define the query itself. In preparation for my showcase later, I'm going to add here a query that should return all the pages that have a specific tag, in my case, article. We will see this in action in a moment. But for this to work, these other nodes, the target nodes, need to have a defined field inside of them with a link back to the main node. So I will call this field parent, and then we will see how it works. The type of output is something you can pick depending on your preferences. For me, I will just leave it as a list of links displayed in line in the front matter. Earlier, I mentioned the possibility to create a formula field. So let's take a look at this one. Here we can enter a formula that calculates values which we have in our front matter. For example, I could say I want to take the value from the number field, add to it a fixed amount of 10, and add on top of this whatever value we have in the cycle field. Once again, I want to make sure that this gets updated automatically whenever there is a change in one of these fields. Next, we have three, type, uh, three field types that are related to the canvas. We have the option to update a value in our front matter based on links or based on groups I'm using there or based on links to specific groups in the canvas. I will show all of those a bit later in the demo because for this to work, we actually need a canvas which I have not created yet. So we need to come back to those a bit later. However, what we can do already is we can take a look at the last four options here, which are object fields. I will start with a list of object fields. So let's imagine a use case where I'm organizing or keeping track of meetings, right? So what I have in meetings always is participants. I will add this. You can see it's an object list. And for each of these participants, I want to track certain information. For example, I would like to track the, I will call it participant name, P name. And here I then have to select the parent of this field. In my case, this is participants. I will accept any value because it's just a text. And you can see that we have this little indentation and the arrow indicating that the participant name is a child object of the participant's object list. So let's, let's add two more. We have the role of a person, or I should rather call it P role probably. Again, belongs to participants and is an input field. And we have the company participants input field. There you go. Okay, so this was an object list with child objects. Now let's see how it looks like for a field that also accepts objects, but uses values as fields. I will call this one logistics. We are still in our meeting mind space, if you like. Does not have a parent because it's on top. All right, then let's add additional fields for the logistics here. First of all, we have the meeting date, belongs to logistics, is of course a date field. I have no special uh, formatting or restrictions here. Then we have the location, 
belonging to logistics. Once again, I should call this M location so I know it's about the meeting because it could be anywhere. And then I have here the meeting type and this I want like to be a cycle value. And I will simply say this could be a one on one meeting. It could be a client meeting or it could be anything else. Doesn't matter right now. And the last one I would like to add is a checkbox field, which tells me whether this is a virtual meeting or not. Again, part of logistics, true or false. If it's yes, it's virtual. If it's no, it's face to face. OK, now we are still missing one last type here, which is a field that accepts a YAML object. I will show only the YAML one. The JSON one works exactly the same way, but instead of YAML formatted code, it would accept JSON code. And I will call this one, I don't know, other info. And of course, this is part of logistics as well. Now let's see how this looks like in real life. I will open a new node here, put it side by side with our class definition. I will call this field demo. Of course, we don't see anything right here because so far it does not really belong to a class, which we can change by right clicking on the title and saying add class to field demo. Currently, we have only one, so we can pick the demo class. This is defined here. We can do the next step in two different ways. The first one is to right click again on the tab and say add missing fields at section, which will open a model where we can say we would like to add all the missing fields at the end of the front matter. So that's one option. The other one is to left click on the class icon and then we get this nice little uh, dialog where we can also say add everything in the front matter or we can also add fields individually so if we say we have our input field and this is missing we could add it here with one click and then we automatically get asked for a value for this so i can enter some text here and if we go back to our node we can see that this is here so it really depends in my case, I would like to add everything because I want to show all the different fields and then we can simply go through them. So this is currently our source code view, as you probably noticed. And of course, I can also write things in here manually. But if I switch to the reading view or the live preview, then I have all the fields with a little icon next to them, first of all, indicating what they are. And then, of course, I can simply input my values. Formula is automatically calculated. The lookup query is still empty because we do not yet have target nodes. We will see this change in a moment. For the date, I can simply pick something here from with the date picker. I can also use the navigation to move on. I can uh, insert the date if I want, and I can clear the field, of course. I leave this as it is for now. You will see that because of the settings that we defined here in the, in the date field, we activated insert as a link by default. It is indeed a link. Talking about links, in the multiple links field, we can add links to multiple pages. And in the single one, we can, of course, only select one single page. For the number, we have our tabs as we defined them before, plus and minus five. But we can also enter anything else that we would like to have there. As you will have noticed, changing the number also updates the formula field. So instead of 10, as it was before, now it's 31. Checkbox, I suppose, is fairly clear. You can check it or uncheck it. Uh, for the cycle values, remember we defined the values 7, 8, 9, so we can simply click through those. We have exactly these three values, and every time it changes, the formula also updates accordingly. Then we have our multiple value selection from lists, so I can pick the value 4 and 6 in this field. And of course, the single value selection only lets me pick one value. Now, coming to participants, this is, as we discussed before, and as you can see here on the left-hand side, an object list with specific attributes. Now, if I click on this field, I get another dialog. Currently, there are no entries, so I can add one. And I can see here, the name is Jane Doe. Her role is to be the CEO, and she works for a company called The Champs. So now we have one additional uh, participant here. But, and that's the nice thing about object lists, I can add here as many as I want. So I can put another one and we say this one is Chodo. He is a CFO and he works for the winners. So now we have two names in here and we also see those in our metadata. And when I switch to the source view again, you have them listed here underneath the participants field. All right, so this is for the object list. Now we have another one left here regarding our logistics. It works similarly, though not the same because we have here just one entry, right? So each meeting has just one date, a location. We have a meeting type, which you can pick. I will say this is a client meeting. Is it virtual? It's not, we meet face to face. And other info, here we can add in YAML format, whatever we want. So we can say person chain, food preference vegetarian, or we can add person go food pref steak 
And if we then go back to our front matter, we once again have here under other info exactly what we put there before. Here we have the, all the logistics. All right. Now I still owe you the demo for the lookup query. For that, let me quickly create a new node. I will call this one lookup demo. I will add a field for tags and give it the value article. Uh, actually, let me make this lookup demo one. And then I create another one, which is basically the same. Uh, we can also have a heading here and some text. Make this a bit nicer. Okay. If we come back here to our field demo node, we can now see that our lookup query is still empty. Why is this? Because remember, if we go back to the settings, we said there needs to be a field, a related field called parent. Now, let me quickly put this also to the side here so we can see all of these things happening at the same time. All right. So what we need now is a field in our target node. So the lookup demo nodes are our target nodes, whereas our field demo is our source node, our lookup node. Now, here we go and say we enter this parent field in line, and then we need a link back to the field demo. And as soon as I do that, you can already see that in the lookup query, we now have lookup demo one. So let me do the same here. There you go. And our lookup query catches now the second demo node as well. And these are basically all the field types, except for the ones related to the canvas, which I'm going to show in the demo in more detail. If all this sounds overwhelming and confusing, don't worry. Everything will fall in place once we apply those things in practice. Now, with settings and field types out of the way, we can look at these mysterious file classes I have been mentioning several times already. Sorry to interrupt. I almost forgot, well, I did forget to quickly ask you to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Assuming you do like it, of course. But since you're still here, the odds for that seem to be good. So, in any case, Thank you. I appreciate it. File classes are a core part of the metadata menu plugin. They are used for defining default fields, options, and field settings per class. Okay, but what is a class in this context? Well, think about the different types of nodes you have or may have in your vault. For example, you may have articles, book summaries, projects, meeting notes, recipes, and so on. With the metadata plugin, you can define specific fields and options that you want to use for each of the various types or classes. I suspect you would have different fields in your front matter for a recipe than for meeting minutes or a book review. These rules and definitions are defined in and managed with classes. Technically, this is done with nodes. So let's go to the previously created classes folder and create a new node. I first want to define a general class, which I will use for all nodes that do not belong to another class. It shall contain a few fields that are always relevant, regardless of the specific node type. So I create a new node and I call it R. Because I created inside the classes folder, which we defined in the settings as the place where we store our classes, the plugin automatically knows that it is a class. And if it does not, you just have, may have to close and reopen your vault. As you can see, we automatically get into the class settings. Now, some of this we know already. We have been working with the file class fields extensively in the previous chapter, but there are two other sections. There is the table view, which gives you a list of all the nodes belonging to the respective class, which currently, of course, is none. And then we have file class settings. Now, before we jump into the file class settings in detail, we want to make sure that the R class is indeed being used every time a new node is created and no other class is assigned. To do so, we go to the settings, metadata menu settings and file class settings. And here in the field that we left empty before, the global file class, we can now select our all class. Once again, doing so will make sure that any node we create will belong to the all class initially. There's another thing that might be useful in this context. It's this setting here to add a file class after create. If you enable this, then you will always be prompted to pick a an existing class for a node. Currently, I have it disabled because I still create nodes quite a lot, which do not need to belong to any class. But if you're working in a way that every node belongs to a specific class, this is very useful. All right, so we have defined our global file class and can get out of the settings. Now, let's see how this works. Let's create two fast fields. One we will simply call tags because this is something I always want to have in my nodes. We'll accept any value, of course. And the second one I will call class because obviously I need to have a field for a class as well. Now the class field should be 
a list where I can pick a single value from because I would like each node to belong to just one class exactly. As we saw before, I can define the values for this list directly here manually, or I can use alternative sources. I can pick sources from a node, which we will see a bit later, or I can use a data view query to return certain items from a list. In my case, I would like to use a data view query. If you don't know anything about data view, that's totally fine. You can simply copy paste the query and simply adapt it to your own needs. What this one does is it gives me a list of pages from a specific folder. In my case, the 90 organize slash classes folder. Remember, this is where we keep all the classes and then just returns the page file name. So basically, this will give me values for this specific list field based on all the nodes I have in this specific folder. All right, so these are the things I always want to have in any new node. Now let's see what happens when I create a new node. I will call it node one. We immediately see this belongs to the all class because of this little icon up here, which is the same as the one defined for the class itself. Now, as we have seen before, if I click on this icon, I will see which fields are missing. I can add them all to the front matter. And there you go. Now here we can say this is all and for tags, we can put whatever we want. Okay, having defined a generate class for all the nodes, I still owe you the details for the file class settings. So let's take a look at those. First item here is simply a value that you can define as you wish for the maximum number of rows you get returned in the table view. Remember, we saw the table view before. It was empty because we had no nodes belonging to this class. Now we have node one and it shows up as it should. The second option is map with tag. So what this does is it binds tags with the class name. So we can activate this and then any nodes that have a tag that matches our class name, in this case R, will automatically be seen and assigned to this respective class. If you don't want this to be based on the file name, you can actually define specific tag names right here. So instead of using the file name, you can say I want all the nodes with the tag article to be treated as a member of this specific class. If you don't want to do it with tags, you can also do it with file paths. So you can say everything in a specific folder shall be part of this class and with bookmark groups. I don't have any bookmark groups, but if I did, they would show up here and you can use them as well. Now you will have noticed that I skipped the button icon. The button icon is simply the definition of which icon should be displayed for nodes belonging to a specific class. So by default, this is the clipboard icon, but we can change this. In order to know what icons you can use there, I suggest going to the website lucide or lucid .dev. Simply look for all the icons, search for one. I will take note here. You can then simply click this little code, copy it over to Obsidian, enter it here, and the node will appear. If you save these changes, then you will see that all the nodes that belong to this class are automatically updated as well. These last two settings here help us with organizing our classes. We can create a kind of tree structure where we have top classes like all and then specific subclasses helping us to organize our front matter for the different node types. So for example, I could add a new class here, which I call project. And if I go to the project settings, I can first change the icon, for example. And we can then say the parent class for the project class should be all. What this does is by default, inheriting all the fields that we have defined for the all class. So our tags and class fields, which we defined in all, will automatically be used for project class nodes as well. Of course, if I don't want to do this, I can say I want to exclude certain fields, which you can then pick from this list here. For the time being, let's just use it as it is. And we have our first two levels of our class hierarchy with all and project underneath. Of course, not every class needs to be part of the hierarchy. If we look at our demo class, we can see there is no parent defined, which is totally fine. Congratulations, you made it through the relatively dry theoretical part. If you skipped it, Feel free to use the detailed chapters to go back and look up anything that seems unclear during the following practical demos. In this section, I will not spend much time on explaining the logic and mechanisms anymore. First, we will see how all this works on its own, that means without needing any other plugins. And then I'm going to walk you through a use case of writing articles or blog posts using the Obsidian Canvas to organize the workflow and the related notes. I believe this is easy to understand. Anything you see here can of course be applied to other topics and areas as well. Let's go back to the previously created class node for project. We already defined a custom icon and we assigned the all node as our parent file class. Now let's add some file class fields. There is face, which is a list of the values backlog, research, write, review, published and outdated. 
Then I have a field called status, which is again a list field with the values to do, in progress, done, blocked, on hold and cancelled. And I want to have a field called priority with the options of low, medium and high. These are all select fields and for now I define the permitted values manually directly in the settings. I do not need to define the class and text field because we inherit those already from the R parent class. I can now create the node project1, assign the class to it and add the related fields. Because we can have different types of projects, we can, and perhaps should, create a class per project type. I will quickly create an article class with the project class as its parent. So you can see how we slowly build a sort of tree out of our classes. This class inherits the class and text fields from the all class, and it also gets the face, status, and priority fields from the project class. However, it also has some specific fields, which I will add now. First, there is author, which is a normal input field, letting me enter any text I want. And then I want to add a date field for the published date, which I call published. By using the parent file class, we just created a structure like this, which helps us to minimize the administrative effort for classes and maximize the front meta quality and consistency across our nodes. But what if we don't want to inherit exactly the same fields that are in our parent class? Well, if we want to remove a parent field completely, we can simply do so in the file class settings under excluded fields. For example, we could remove the status field from my article class. If we want to keep the field but have different values for it, we can edit again with the same name and customize the values. Here I just copy the face field from the project class to my article class. Then I add the face rejected to it. Going back to our article node, we can now see the new faces in the list of available options too, while the values in the project node remain unchanged. One more thing to make this easier. You will recall that I defined the values for each list field manually. As this is a nightmare to maintain, I practically never do this in real life. Instead, I work with lookups. Here is how that works and where the dedicated organized folder comes in very handy. The face field for our project class is a good example. I want to replace these manually defined values with a lookup. As you can see, we can change the values source type to values from a node. But first, we need to create this node. So I go back to my Organize folder and create a new folder there called Lookups. In there, we create a node and call it Project Face. Then we add one value per line to that node. Back in the field settings, we now change the source type to Values from a node and then select this node Project Face. Back in the Project 1 node, we can still select the value for the face field as before. But if I now add a new face to the Lookup node, this change will automatically be reflected and the new value will be available to pick from the list. This is much faster and easier than going to the field settings. So you can see, with a bit of planning, you can build a flexible set of classes and, if needed, a class hierarchy that, in combination with templates, will help you to keep your nodes front matter consistent. For the second use case, we will combine the functionality of the metadata menu plugin with one of Obsidian's core plugins. The canvas. This combination will let you manage your nodes and their metadata by simply dragging them around on a canvas. It will also let you establish a workflow and visualize your work progress. I use this approach for managing my Obsidian videos and a digital garden that I publish via Obsidian to my website. Moving nodes around on this canvas will update their status. For example, currently all the nodes are published. If I were to move one into a different box or group, and update my digital garden, this node would automatically be unpublished too. Okay, we are back in my sandbox. The first thing to do is to create a new canvas. I will call it MDM and Canvas Demo. I want to use the canvas to visualize my workflow and where each of my articles is in that workflow. I also wanted to update the respective article's front matter for its face and status depending on where it is on the canvas. To do so, I create horizontal swim lanes for the status. In my case, they are for backlog, in progress, done, cancelled, and on hold. But you can put there whatever suits your needs, of course. Then I add vertical swim lanes for the face. I will use research, writing, review, published, 
and outdated. If I arrange these swim lanes nicely, it will give us a grid or a matrix if you like. These swim lanes are what Canvas calls groups. We need to remember that for the next step. Now let's prepare the article class for working with Canvas. For that, I add two new fields called C phase and C status to differentiate them from the previously defined ones. For both fields, I define the field type to be updates with groups in Canvas. Then I need to tell the field which Canvas to look for. We now have a logical connection from our node, article1, to the article class and to our canvas. Next, I need to add a new node. I will add a card first and call it article2. Once I have my ideas collected as cards, I start converting them into files with the same respective name. When I open such a file in a new tab and make sure that I am in source mode, we can see that there is no front matter at all but that the file belongs to the all class, indicated by the icon next to its name. Now we can right click on the node title, we remove the all class and the nodes icon changes to that of the article class. If we click on that icon, we can select individual fields to be added to our front matter or add all the missing ones in one go. We also see our class hierarchy starting with all via project to article and can decide to only add the fields that come directly with each of these classes. I do so and in our front matter we now see tags, face, status, published and author. If I now move the node on the canvas to the intersection of backlog and research, its front matter gets updated automatically. Oh, but hold the phone. We now have both values in each field. That's not what we want. So we need to tell the class which swim lanes or canvas groups map to which field. Let me delete these fields from the front matter again and go to the article class field settings and look at the C phase field first. At the bottom of the dialog, we can define that the field shall be populated based on canvas groups identified by colors or by the group names. If each of your groups has a different color, you can use those of course. In my case, I have three faces with the same color and even one face and one status group are red, so I have the same color. This means colors are not going to work for me. Instead, I will define the group names, adding each of the face names here. Then I do the same for the C status field. Of course, this needs to be done only once, but if you add new faces or statuses, you would have to update these values. Let's go back to our node to see the front matter. If I now move the node on the canvas, both fields get updated correctly. The same principle applies when we are updating front matter fields based on links we do on the canvas between items rather than the groups they belong to. Here I opened the three article nodes I prepared earlier and as you can see article 3 already contains front matter for C status and C phase based on the steps we did just before. Now I'm going to drag article 1 and article 2 on my canvas as well. As soon as I do that, of course, the front matter for C status and C phase gets updated in both nodes as well. What I would like to do now is to show the sequence of these articles. So I go to the file class fields and add two new fields. One for previous chapter and the second one for next chapter. For both fields, I choose the field type updates with links in Canvas. For the field previous chapter, we choose incoming because we want to track from which chapter or from which node on the canvas an arrow or a connection is pointing towards the respective node. For the field next chapter, it's of course the other way around. If I now draw an arrow from article 1 to article 2 on my canvas, you will see that both nodes get updated accordingly. And of course, the same is true when I do it from article 2 to article 3. Of course, I can still move the nodes around on our canvas. As long as they stay within the defined groups, the front matter of these nodes is going to be updated accordingly. And even when I move it to different groups, the front matter information for previous and next chapter, based on the links that we created, not the groups, is not going to change. This concludes another deep dive into one of Obsidian's more complex plugins. Let me know in the comments what you liked or did not like about the video. And if you have any requests for one of the next ones, drop them there too. I'd rather make videos about topics people are interested in than what I think they might like. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching and see you next time.